So thank you, everybody. Welcome. I'm very happy to have everyone from across Canada and around the world join us for this exclusive town hall. As a valued member of CUSO's alumni community, we are so pleased to bring you an insider's look, a real insider's look at the new seven-year volunteer for development program. My name is Tina and I think many of you have met me before and I'm the outreach and partnerships officer. I'll be facilitating today's session. I'd like to start off by doing a land acknowledgement from where I am. Toronto is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and we are grateful to be able to live and work on this land. Today's town hall is curated especially for you, and joining me today is Tanya Shepard. I think some of you may have met Tanya at the last town hall. Tanya is head of programs for Latin America, the Caribbean, and Southeast Asia. She's worked in international development for the past 20 years, with direct experience working in Bolivia, Brazil, and Chile. And her focus is working in community-based development, women's rights and participation, and youth economic empowerment. She has strong project design and management experience overseeing the implementation of large bilateral projects, projects financed by Global Affairs Canada, and most recently, the European Union. And so everybody could see you, Tanya. Please say hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. And we also have with us David Ferret. David might be new to our town halls, but... It, this won't be his last one. I'm sure he'll come back and back for more. David is head of programs for Africa. He has project management profession. He has a PMP certification with 16 years of professional experience in international development and cooperation with a proven track record and ability to manage projects on scope, time, and budget. David is committed to continuous learning and innovation and enjoys leading multicultural and multidisciplinary teams. He has experience living and working in the USA, Tunisia, Burundi, and Benin. David, please say hello so everybody could see you. Hello, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you both for spending the next hour with us. It's going to be a great town hall and I just want us to have a little bit of fun, relax. We're in a safe environment with alumni, our alumni community. Together for nearly 60 years, CUSO International has worked with over 15,000 volunteers in more than 100 countries. I think that bears repeating, 15,000 volunteers in more than 100 countries. Thank you. Thank you for creating opportunity, security, and dignity for people in need, especially women and girls. It's this direct impact on people's lives that we would like to share our newest Volunteer for Development program with you. A little bit of housekeeping beforehand. For those of you who are using a computer, I know some of you may be joining us by telephone, but for those of you using a computer, you'll see that there's a Q&A box on your screen. Please feel free to add comments or questions throughout the town hall discussion and we will answer them, leave time at the end to answer them. At this point, I also wanna let you know that behind the scenes, I have my colleague, Linda, who may uh, also be answering questions during the town hall discussion. I also invite you to participate in our polls. What are polls, you ask? Well, let's try our first one. So on the screen, it asks, where did you volunteer? And as I just mentioned, we know that there's over 100 countries. I'm not able to put 100 countries, so you'll see regions. And I'll just leave this up for a couple of seconds. Lots of you have answered. I'll cut it off in five, four, three, two, one. And we'll come back to those results in just a little bit. But let's get started and right into this discussion. The question that I want to ask Tanya will really set the foundation for the next hour. And it's around our Volunteer for Development program. Tanya, can you put our next Volunteer for Development program into an elevator pitch? And if it's a 10-story ride, give us the highlights and the envisioned impact. Great, thank you, Tina. First of all, I must thank Global Affairs Canada for their support in the successful completion of our previous volunteer cooperation known as VOICE and the start of our new seven-year volunteer cooperation program. We very much appreciate the continued support of the Canadian government. Now on to what we're getting up to over the next seven years. So over the next seven years, CUSO International's flagship volunteer 
for Development Program is expected to reach about 1.8 million people across 10 countries in Latin America and Africa. The Sharing Canadian Expertise for Inclusive Development and Gender Equality Project, known as SHARE for short, ultimately aims to improve the economic and social well-being of women and girls and other vulnerable populations in developing countries. Through SHARE, QS will be working in collaboration with our local partners to maximize their impact and deliver more effective, innovative, inclusive, and environmentally sustainable projects and services directly in response to the local needs of poor and marginalized groups with an explicit focus on women and girls. QS will be implementing SHARE in a total of 10 countries over seven years, which is very exciting. The countries include Benin, Cameroon, Colombia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Honduras, Jamaica, Nigeria, Peru, and Tanzania. And most of these countries were included in, past, in our past volunteer cooperation program. So we're very excited to continue working alongside of our partners in these countries again. Here in Canada, CUSO's goal is to reach about 2.6 million Canadians through public engagement, knowledge sharing, and volunteer alumni activities. We really understand the importance of Canadians in international development efforts, and we continue will try to engage Canadians in the work that we're doing on the ground with our local partners. One way we're going to do this is through town halls, such as today, so that we can enhance Canadians' engagement in and knowledge about Canada's development efforts in line with Canada's feminist international systems policy, as well as other global key issues. We feel it's important to engage Canadians because even though they may not be on the ground in the countries where we're working, Canadians still play a role in educating other audiences about the role that Canada plays in development efforts, sharing their past experiences, as well as help to spread information about the impact that Canada can have in international development efforts. The SHARE project will specifically contribute to a number of sustainable economic goals, which includes goal one, no poverty, Goal three, good health and well-being. Goal five, gender equality. Goal 10, reduced inequality. Goal three, climate action. Goal 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. And finally, goal 17, which is at the heart of CUSO's work, which is partnerships. Partnerships are key to CUSO's model, and we will continue to manage quality partnerships with at least 136 local partners. This includes all levels, such as government, civil society and community-based organizations and private sector entities, as well as Canadian and multilateral strategic partners to increase our impact and the sustainability of our work. If we look at SHARE from a volunteer recruitment lens, which our alumni in the call today will be very familiar, CUSA will aim to deploy about 1,100 volunteers over the seven years, 100 of whom will be our E, will be the e-volunteering, so we'll continue to build on our experience with virtual uh, volunteering platforms. And this translates into about 132,000 volunteer days over seven years. So we're very excited to start engaging our fellow Canadians in the program and helping to work alongside our local partners. Uh, this is where I'd like to pause and explain a little bit about COVID-19. We're all aware that we're in a global pandemic and unfortunately, this has certain impacts, not only on SHARE, but impacts on other projects and programs that are being implemented all over the world. As we watch the news, we see that the pandemic's course is still unpredictable. I don't think really anybody understands what the full impact of COVID will be, but also what are the sort of medium and long-term impacts of the pandemic. With the associated health and security risks that entail, and through on ongoing conversations with the Government of Canada, CUSO has decided to wait until April 2021 before we begin to send volunteers abroad. I can say that this was not a decision that was taken lightly, but we really need to take into account the safety and security of our volunteers, our staff, as well as our local partners. In a number of countries, such as Colombia and Peru, we're still dealing with borders being closed, there's no international flights, businesses are still not operating. So it's important first that we have a great overview and understanding of the context in each of the countries that we are operating in. Our senior management and project management teams are continuing to explore all our options in order to minimize the impact 
of the delayed employment to our partners. So we're exploring such avenues as e-volunteering. If we can start to engage and provide support to our local partner through e-volunteering. Also, we've been having ongoing dialogue with Global First Canada, our donors, and they are very understanding of the impact of the current situation, the impact it has in our program, as well as the impact it has for volunteer cooperation agencies. CUSO, along with other volunteer cooperation agencies, are sharing their recommendations with Global First Canada, including, for example, greater, greater flexibility for CUSO to engage South-South volunteers, also to engage national volunteers, as well as other types of local volunteers. While we understand the commitment to engaging Canadians on the ground with local partners, during this difficult time, we are looking for other potential uh, avenues or opportunities where we can support our local partners. We're also looking at sort of the greater flexibility of the disbursement of our project funds. So before COVID, we had designated many of these project funds to direct capacity building activities on the ground. In light of COVID-19, we are trying to respond to the needs of our partners and shifting the use of our project funds so we're able to support our partners better during this time. Our international program team continues to undertake many of the startup activities in preparation for SHARE. So for example, we can start with capacity assessments of all our partners, developing baselines, so we're measuring the success of the work of CUSO and our partners, as well as providing continued support through e-volunteering and e-person, I'm sorry, and in-person volunteering by Canadians that are already in the country. So in countries such as Colombia, for example, there's still a number of Canadians on the ground who are interested in participating as volunteers. So we're able to do some in-country recruitment already. Peru is also a country that's looking at engaging Canadians that may already be on the ground. Um, thanks to you, our alumni, CUSO continues to create scalable, sustainable, and equitable solutions to poverty and equality in regions around the world. And we are very much looking forward to continuing so with SHARE. I think the town hall today is important to engage our alumni who hopefully in the future may want to re-volunteer with us or provide some support to CUSO in other ways. Thank, Thank you. Tina. Thank you, Tandy. That is absolutely excellent. Um, David, now maybe you can share a little bit of your insights into global issues volunteers are supporting through international development and kind of the state of the world today. Thank you, Tina. That's a tall order, but I'll, uh, I'll try. Uh, interestingly, um, when we worked on the uh, program proposal a few months ago, uh, Tandy uh, and I and also several colleagues at QSO, uh, COVID-19 was uh, not a part of our reality. So, <laughs> Uh, when we uh, propose our, our solution to these problems, uh, COVID-19 was not part of the planning. So what I want to do uh, today is just highlight a number of um, impact that have been highlighted by several agencies in recent months, just to show uh, the importance of, uh, of a program like, uh, like SHARE and also of other similar initiative in the current context. You know, in, in Canada, I think we've all seen the, the negative impact of the, the pandemic on our, our health, our, our economy, uh, our, our society. Uh, so if it's true in Canada, it's also true in, uh, in Africa. Uh, I've been uh, reading several uh, news articles and, and reports, and I just wanted to cite a few, uh, a few stats that really captured my, my attention uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, for instance, the World Bank uh, predicted that the African economy, so the economy on the African continent, would uh, decrease by 2.1% uh, this year. So it would be the first recession in 25 years in, in Africa. Uh, again, according to the World Bank, the pandemic could push around 40 to 60 million people into extreme poverty, and, and half of them uh, would be living in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Another uh, terrible report that came out of the African Union about the impact of the pandemic on the job uh, market and employment uh, was, was citing the fact that almost 20 million jobs could be affected uh, by COVID-19 in, in Africa. And a moment where really uh, the focus is to create new jobs for the youth uh, coming out of schools and, and looking for work in the informal and informal sector. Uh, and more recently this morning, I was reading a report from the WHO saying that uh, close to 50 countries reported disruption to family planning and uh, contraception services in the last few months or so since, since March. 
so that's really uh, you know terrible uh, consequences and terrible uh, effects on uh, the poor and marginalized people that we're trying to support and, and help as part of SHARE. So definitely uh, COVID-19 will undermine what has been accomplished by the, the MDGs and will also affect uh, our ability to achieve the goals that were set in the, uh, the SDGs, the, the goals that Tandy uh, presented before. Another key element for us to consider as a, an NGO in, in Canada is how the pandemic will affect uh, aid flows and, and priorities. So how will Canada, the UN and other donors will react and how they will uh, decide on uh, the investment that will be made in the future. Of course, COVID is important, but all the other issues, problems uh, that, we're trying, that we were trying to address in the past are still present, very much present. Uh, so we have to ensure that we're not forgetting about, about them in the context of, of COVID. So uh, lots of work ahead for us, for volunteers, and also for our partners. Thank you, David. Um, so, Tanya, in your introduction on explaining the Volunteer for Development program, you spoke a bit about our commitment to women's rights and women's participation. Are you able to give us some examples on those commitments of women's empowerment? Yes, I can. So, I will give some country specific examples of the impact we had under voice. Uh, something that comes to mind is the experience we had in Honduras. If many people are aware, Honduras has some of the highest rates of femicide. Uh, so, we work alongside leading women's organizations around women's rights, women's participation, how can we better protect women uh, in other marginalized, marginalized groups against violence. So CUSA worked with the National Institute for Women, which is an arm of the government. They're seen as one of the leading government agencies that focuses on gender and gender issues. And CUSA worked alongside the Institute on the design of an anonymous web-based platform that allows women and other individuals to assess if they are in an abusive relationship or at the risk of being in an abusive relationship. And I think in light of today's use of technology that most people have a smartphone or access to the internet, it's really important that we look at new tools that are anonymous that women and other groups can use to really assess, you know, uh, is there violence in their life? What can they do to prevent violence? But also what are some of the services, support service, legal services that are available to victims so that they feel better supported. In Jamaica, We've also done a lot of work around girls, uh, young girls, uh, and women's empowerment. So CUSO worked with the Women's Research and Outreach Center to implement summer and after school programs to build the skills of young girls. So we find in Jamaica it's really important to start skill building, uh, you know, life planning, uh, you know, rights of young girls or adolescent girls so that they understand sort of empowerment. What does it mean to be a girl? What is girls empowerment? So that was very exciting. We also partnered with Women's Inc, who is one of the leading women's organizations in Jamaica. They've been around, I believe, more than 50 years. They're very instrumental in a lot of the policy and legislation in Jamaica. Women's Inc is starting to recognize that in order to address traditional um, societal norms and behaviors, it's not only important to work with young girls and adolescents and women, but it's also important to work with men and young boys. So they had a series of workshops where they are sitting down with men to have open conversations about what are the perceptions of women, uh, girls, adolescents in society, and, and how can we change those behaviors. And one of the interesting things is that we're not only doing training with men, which is important, but then they were looking at the men to then replicate the training with the boys or you know, with their sons and their family. So we're seeing these shifts also in sort of gender issues and what we need to do to change traditional beliefs and norms around gender. In Colombia, we've been working with Fundacion Aqua for probably the last five or six years. And their specific focus is on women's economic empowerment. So we had the opportunity, first of all, to work with Aqua around specific gender training. Uh, when we first started with Aqua five years ago, they didn't have, they, they understood what gender is. They work a lot with women's groups, but within the organization as a whole, they didn't have a gender strategy. 
So we work with them to build a capacity about using, you know, inclusive language in the workspace. What is a gender strategy within their programming and how better to integrate gender. But also their main focus is really on strengthening women led businesses. So we did a lot of exciting work on the coast of Columbia working with uh, female uh, entrepreneurs specifically one example was they worked in the sort of fishing sector with a focus on crabs so we helped them you know around strengthening their small businesses looking at marketing plans uh, looking at accessing other markets in Peru uh, we've done a lot of work uh, in around women's rights women's participation and a lot of work with local women's organizations to advance the feminist movement or the women's movement in Peru We've worked many years with Movimiento Manuel Ramos, who is one of the leaders in promoting women's rights and prevention of violence against women in Peru. We do a lot of work around building the capacity on the design of advocacy campaigns, specifically to advance women's rights with specific focus on violence against women. But what we're seeing that's interesting in Peru is there's, new, there's a movement of new young female leaders. So when we're doing advocacy campaigns or communication, communication campaigns, a lot of the times these campaigns are led by young female leaders. So the future generations are going to help to promote women's rights and participation. So that's sort of a brief summary of what we've been doing in Latin American Caribbean. Very exciting. And we look forward to continuing the work under SHARE. Thank you, Tandy. And so um, now, before we just go on to David, I would uh, like to share the poll results with you. So the question of where you volunteered, this is a perfect segue as 49% were in the continent of Africa. That's our next question to David. So I'll stop sharing and we'll continue on. David, the question I have for you um, is asking you to help us better understand our priority areas. Knowing that we're operating in six countries within the continent, what is the areas of work within Africa? Thank you, Tina. I'll just say a few words on the selection of, the, of these countries. So when we worked uh, again on the design of the program and our, on our proposal to uh, Global Affairs Canada, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on where you sit, we were not working with a blank sheet, right? We had to consider the priorities of our, of our donor. Uh, and in the call, it was clear that they wanted uh, the program to be focused uh, and to, be, to have most of the resources invested in, in Africa. So definitely this, you know, this requirement guided the selection of countries. And, and that's why you'll see that in the new program, we have uh, six African countries and uh, four countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. So, uh, definitely, we wanted to respond to, to this requirement, and we also had to consider our, our history, the experience of CUSO, and we really wanted to consolidate our, our country programs. We didn't feel that it was the right time to uh, start uh, operations in, in new countries. We, we believe that we should stay with partners for the long haul and that we should maintain some uh, kind of stability in this uh, unstable world. So we really wanted to, to keep uh, countries, most of the countries that were part of our previous volunteer for development program. We also looked at um, our internal strategic plan. Uh, so in 2018, QSO adopted uh, its, its strategic plan and really the thematic focus was the gender, was gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, youth economic empowerment, as well as volunteerism for development. So of course, the selection of partners and the selection of, of focus areas had to reflect what I've just said, you know, the priority of the donor, our own history and experience, and also uh, the goals that we had set in the strategic plan. Uh, so just to give you an example, uh, in, in Benin, and I'm hoping that uh, some of our participants will, uh, will know the partners that I'll be uh, mentioning. So in, in Benin, we'll be working with, uh, with APESA, uh, in DRC with Fondation Femme Plus, uh, with, UNFPA in Nigeria to address uh, gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. Then for youth economic empowerment, we'll be partnering with the Job Creation Commission in, in Ethiopia, as well as a small industry development organization in, in Tanzania. And finally, as an example of our work in, in B4D or Volunteerism for Development, uh, we'll be uh, partnering and supporting the Ministry of Youth and Civic Education in, in Cameroon. 
so as Tandy mentioned, we've, uh, we have more than 100 partners, but I just wanted to give you uh, uh, some examples of the, the partnerships that we are currently considering or uh, confirming as we are uh, developing our, our plans for the coming years. Thank you, David. Um, now, continuing along those lines of partnership, Tandy, you talked about it being uh, the essence of, of CUSO's model for development. Maybe you can give us some examples of impact that volunteers have made within your partnerships and local partners. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm going to share some experience we had in Philippines. It was a story that was profiled uh, in our in one of our latest catalysts, and it was quite inspirational to me. We had a, a CUSO volunteer, a Canadian, I believe from the West Coast, who went to the Philippines to work with a social enterprise called the Bese Association of Native Industry Growth. It's a group of women who create woven products using sustainable materials. And it was quite exciting because first of all, this association came out of the, you know, the need for women to generate incomes for their families, specifically after a natural disaster in 2013, a typhoon that hit. Um, and so the women had these products, they were weaving mats, hats, other types of products, but really they needed sort of a push and support to access new markets. So in coordination with this volunteer who has a lot of experience with product development and advising uh, companies on products and markets and, and how to sell products, she started to work alongside of the women and saw that they were using a lot of social media. So what they did together is they designed the first online distribution channel using social media platforms such as Facebook. This allowed the women to access new markets that they previously hadn't thought about, so international markets, for example. It allowed them to increase their production because it was greater demand and ultimately increase their profits, which is you know, why we all work is we need to make money to feed our families. And what was really exciting, so I think there's one thing where you have local markets, so tourism, for example, or people buying mats for their homes. But in this particular case, um, thinking at a particular market on the West Coast, the women started to weave meditation mats that were then sold and shipped to Vancouver. So that was really inspiring the role that one volunteer can help in supporting uh, a local association, but sharing her knowledge, her experience, and building the capacity of the women so that once she left, they're able to continue with their, with their new distribution channels. In Peru, we also had another exciting experience working alongside partner. This is a little bit different in the sense that CUSO created a platform. Usually a lot of our work is focused on uh, community-based or local organizations. In this specific case, the idea was the concept of urban agriculture. I think it's something that's very well known in Canada. We have farmers markets. We have different types of markets on Sundays, on the weekend. But in Peru, it's one area that's relatively new. So CUSO, alongside of partners from the local municipalities, uh, the private sector, academia, and civil society organizations, organized sort of an ecosystem of local partners that really wanted to focus on building the capacity of communities in peri-urban areas, so outside of the Lima Center. These are communities that uh, they're built in the desert basically, so it's very arid, there's not a lot of green space. And the idea was to build a capacity of urban farmers so that they could start to grow produce to address the issues of food insecurity, but basically issues of just providing food for your family. So through this platform, uh, CUSO was able to design training modules such as organic certification, diversification of products, new techniques and sort of farming in urban areas. And we were able to train you know, hundreds of farmers from different communities. And a lot of these farmer, urban farmers are women. It's women who really just need to sell products so that they have money for their children's education, but also to feed their families. So it was really exciting when we went to visit some of these women and their farms. And it's quite impressive to see sort of a brown space. It's very arid, it's very dusty, there's a lot of sand. And then there's these beautiful green spaces uh, in these different municipalities. So it's a really good example of how CUSOs who had experience in urban agriculture, in environmental management, et cetera, working alongside this ecosystem of partners. 
Thank you, David and Tandy. I think that gives a real broad uh, and excellent overview of CUSO's model of partnerships. That, yeah, I'm sure you can go on for another 10 minutes on uh, the different partnerships within the different regions. But what I think we'll do now is go to our second poll. So you are great at your first one. Um, so here's the second poll. Now that you've heard David and Tandy share some insights about the next seven years, what you should be seeing on your screen right now, it says, what is your level of optimism that the world is getting better through the efforts of skilled volunteers? And you have a, a selection of options there. I'll just leave this up for another few seconds. I know there's a lot of you on the line. This is wonderful. But looking at time, oh, we have good time. We have some time. So I'm going to leave this up for another maybe five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And we'll come back to those results. So moving along, um, this question is actually for both of you. So I don't know who wants to dive in first, but it really is around uh, demonstrating CUSO's impact and how we are accountable, not only to our donors, but the citizens, especially the beneficiaries and local partners, as well as Canadians here at home. I don't know who wants to take that question first, but it, it is for both of you to, to spend some time on and you can elaborate because we do have a good amount of time. Okay, uh, I can start. Um, it's a very good question and it's a question that really is uh, on the top of our agenda and our, and our mind uh, under SHARE, but under all uh, the other projects that we're implementing. And I think to show and to demonstrate impact, you need impact stories uh, on the one end and then impact data on the other end. So impact stories, I think you can see them uh, on a daily basis on our website. It's really about specific example of, of changes, of, uh, of, of results, uh, that can be captured at the, the, the personal level, the individual level, or the community level. Uh, and, and that's great because it shows concretely how we're working with, you know, with human beings uh, to, to change their reality and to, uh, to make our contribution to a better world. But then you also need at the, let's say, the program level, impact data. So statistics on, you know, performance, on people serve, on level of satisfaction, on a number of key performance indicators that we have uh, established in our uh, performance measurement framework. So I think you need both to convince, uh, to convince yourself, uh, to convince the organization, but also the public and the donor that you're actually uh, achieving uh, results and uh, generating impact. So we will collect uh, these stories and, and this data via three uh, sources. And this is something that we've done in the past, but um, it can be uh, improved along the way. So the first, the first step is really to work with uh, the selected partners to conduct a collaborative and joint needs assessment. So we have to be realistic about uh, what we can provide, what the partners need in a, in a given time frame, and also the type of support that we can provide via our experienced volunteers, but also our our program funds. Uh, it's really important for us that we do not impose our views. Uh, of course, we have certain things that we would like to promote as part of the program, but we really want to listen to our partners and understand uh, their key priorities and, uh, and obstacles and work with them to, to find solutions. So once we have um, an agreement on the way forward, uh, we'll be implementing a number of activities and then we'll get feedback from three sources, as, as mentioned. First, the volunteers. Uh, I think we have a, a group of experienced volunteers with us today, so they'll be familiar with the, you know, the placement report. Uh, so we get uh, on a frequent basis placement report from the volunteers and they'll assess how their placement is going and also how the partner is responding or, or changing or performing. Then uh, on a semi-annual basis, we'll also have um, a session with the partner to review the partnership agreement and ask them to basically go through a self-assessment, look at uh, the, uh, the placement with the volunteer, but also the, uh, the impact or the evolution of their, their capacity uh, to offer uh, services and support to, to their community, but also uh, ask them to rate their performance. Is it you know, going better? Uh, is it the same? Is it more challenging than it was when we started the, the agreement? So 
we really want to get the feedback from, from the partner. And thirdly, um, and to be frank, that's a key element uh, in the feedback loop, is trying to get uh, you know, the views from the beneficiaries, the clients, the participants. So of course, we want the volunteers to have a great placement experience and really uh, be able to share their technical and soft skills. Of course, we want the partner to be satisfied with the support that is provided by, by QSO, uh, by our staff in, uh, in the country program offices, but also uh, the support provided by volunteers. But more importantly, we want to make sure that uh, the beneficiaries, the clients, the participants, the communities are, I guess, satisfied or seeing an evolution in the services that they're getting from the partners. And that's a bit trickier because we do have to go through uh, consultations with a number of stakeholders, uh, you know, share is implemented in 10 countries, but it's really something that we want to, to really push and, uh, and prioritize in, in share. Uh, so I'll stop here and I'm sure uh, Tandy might have some additional reflection on, on that subject. Sure, thank you, David. Um, one fond memory I have under voice, and I think it was a key way of way we, how we tried to share the impact of our volunteers and local partners, but also the impact of volunteer cooperation programs on our beneficiaries. And something that QSO did at various occasions, and I was able to be part of these, was they organized communication brigades, which really involved sending a team from uh, headquarters to the field to capture some of these stories. So through interviews, photographs, and videos, as well as personal stories, we were able to accurately and realistically capture what QSO and local partners were doing on a daily basis. So for example, I remember that we traveled to Nicaragua on one of these brigades where we met marginalized women who are becoming econo economically empowered after leaving abusive relationships and starting their own agricultural associations or cooperatives, for example. So it was really empowering to see women who may have come from really difficult circumstances and through relationships with our local partners where QSO is supporting, we were able to see the, the impacts. And I'll just share one quick story with you. I remember we were sitting around a table in Nicaragua and the question was posed, um, you know, what is the impact on your life working with a partner that QSO has been partnering with? And the lady said, you know, three years ago when I had to sign a document, I didn't know how to write or read, so I had to use my thumbprint. And I was like, okay, that's normal. That happens in a lot of countries around the world. And she said, after participating in the training programs uh, through this partner and supported by CUSO volunteers, uh, the next time I had to sign for a document or to register for something, she was able to write her name. And that was one of the most impactful stories that we could have collected because we saw directly the impact it has. It's over long term, you know, change doesn't happen overnight, but working alongside our partners for months, for years, we really got to see some of the changes on the ground. Thank you, Tandy that, and, and David. I think those are excellent examples of uh, demonstrating our impact. Now it's time to, uh, for our audience members, our alumni community, for you to start thinking about your questions. And while you're doing that, once again, a reminder to please use the Q&A tab. I see there's some questions already there. Um, but let's get to the results of our second poll before we move on. So I think, well, not an even tie, but between very optimistic and somewhat optimistic. And so give us some time. We have seven years to convert you over to very optimistic. So thank you for participating and engaging. Um, so before I actually go to the Q&A box, uh, thank you to those of you who sent in your questions in advance. Uh, I would like to get to those. So in the invitation, there was an, an opportunity for our alumni community to send questions in advance. So let's get to some of those first. And then for sure, I'll get, we'll get to as many. We have a good amount of time. So we'll get to as many questions as we can. So the first question um, that came in was, what lessons learned from the past decades of CUSO's volunteer track record gave rise to this new seven-year volunteer for development program? And I think I'll lob that question over to David. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, so not only identifying lessons learned, but uh, applying them as you design or implement a new program. 
So I think I'll just highlight three, three items. The first one, uh, and really uh, our experience uh, is going faster than we initially thought with COVID, but you know, the recruitment, the assessment, and the reintegration of volunteers for many reasons is now done uh, you know, on, online. Uh, we had started the online or the panel interview of, uh, of candidates uh, a few months ago and decided it was a better way for us to bring the country offices closer to the candidates and ensure that they had this touch point before uh, a confirmation of selection. So really uh, this idea of bringing the country program office staff, but also the partner really closer to the recruitment process in Canada was a key learning for us. Uh, I've seen in the last six years with QSO uh, uh, a decision, a conscious decision to focus uh, you know, in the, the previous volunteer cooperation program, not voice, but the one before, I think we we're working in 25 countries and probably 20 teams. Uh, and the idea was really to, you know, to do everything everywhere. And it was based on good intentions, but uh, I don't think it was the most effective way to uh, provide assistance and support. So really we've decided in this one to focus on three key themes that I've mentioned. Uh, they're still quite broad, but it's still, uh, it's a guiding principle for us. And then ensuring that we select partners carefully and that we limit the number of partners. So instead of having 24, 25 partners in a, in a given country, we'll try to focus on, let's say eight to 10 partners. And it might lead to, you know, the assignment of two volunteers or two volunteers with the same partner, but we feel it's just, easier to, to manage and it's a good way to have a significant you know influence and potentially impact on, on the partner and and its community and and finally uh, this is a recurring team with volunteers and partners managing expectations uh, you know going from the needs assessment uh, to the partnership negotiation to the the design of the placement then recruitment a lot of things can change and can go well and can go wrong uh throughout that process so really trying to be uh clear with partners and with volunteers on you know the the picture that was taken at a certain point in time the evolution of the situation on the ground and the need for both parties uh, to be flexible and adaptable uh throughout their their collaboration Thank you, David. And another question that came in in advance, um, I'll lob this over to Tandy. They ask, will the SHARE project be enlisting the work of South-South volunteers? And that's a good question. I mean, I, I think that's a question on everybody's minds because in the last volunteer cooperation, we did have a, a strong South-South volunteer component. Under the SHARE program, the guidelines are that Gold of Earth Canada would like us to engage Canadians as volunteers. So in principle, we do not have a South-South volunteering component. However, in light of COVID, excuse me, we are having discussions with Gold of Earth Canada to see if that's a possibility uh, in the near future. Uh, but again, that also depends on travel. In the past, it was easy for somebody from Colombia to travel to Peru. In light of COVID, we don't know if that's going to even be possible because of travel restrictions. Um, I think if South-South uh, wasn't an option due to travel restrictions, then of course, we would look at engaging national or local volunteers. So we are having these discussions uh, with Global Earth Canada, uh, and it is definitely an option on the table. Great. Thank you, so still TBD. And the final question that we had in advance was, what will be the role of Canadian and non-Canadian volunteers for future CUSO programs, both during this COVID period and post COVID? I think you both talked a little bit, uh, or actually quite extensively to some degree within the capacity building element, but maybe you wanna broaden that a little bit. I don't know who wants to take it, maybe Andy? Did you wanna start? Sure, I can, I can start. I think it's a bit, uh, we, we do have a number of placements already on our, our uh, volunteer recruitment board. Uh, as mentioned, we have to go through this process of, you know, uh, jointly assessing the capacity and the needs of partners. But definitely, if I had to uh, identify a few um, uh, skills or, or areas of work, I would say definitely organizational development and, and uh, change management. I would say communication and um, advocacy 
uh, I would say monitoring and evaluation. And also I would say uh, resource mobilization. So a sophisticated word to say, finding resources to enable partners to do their, their work. So uh, it doesn't mean that uh, volunteers would have to be a specialist in these areas, but they would have to be able to, to support uh, our partners and, and their staff in these, these broad areas of, of work. And also uh, another, you know, fashion the term uh, in, in the current context is innovation. So uh, bringing this innovation perspective into the, uh, the life and the workspace with, with our partners based on you know, your experience in Canada or, or abroad, but also based on uh, the, the current trends in, in technology or best practices and the delivery of social services. Thank you, Tandy. Did you want to add anything? No, I mean, I think something that some of the feedback we've got in countries like the Caribbean, for example, is supporting local governments sort of medium and long term. So I think we would look at, you know, what is the role of volunteers to build the capacity of government? I think one thing is responding in the moment, but how do you develop or design response mechanisms so they're able to better respond in the future? I think that's a role that Canada can play. And of course, through Canadian volunteers, we can provide support. And I think part of what we need to think moving forward is long-term strategies to deal with pandemics or crisis so that our local partners have the tools, they have the resources to be able to respond quickly uh, and, and also be flexible at the same time. Thank you. So now let's get to our live board. Um, Okay, so, uh, wow, this is, I'm going to, give me a second. I haven't seen these in advance, so. We'll only take the easy one, Tina. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I would like to see CUSO actively encouraging alumni to offer their suggestions on how the how, quote, this is in quotes, power of experience of CUSO's alumni group might be better mobilized. Um, uh, so the question I believe is, I guess, utilizing um, the alumni to offer suggestions uh, on how the power of experience of CUSO's alumni group might be better mobilized. I'm not sure who wants to take that question. Sure. I mean, I can start. I think just through my work with Eileen and her team, I know something that, you know, we did under voice was really trying to uh, organize alumni events where we can bring alumni maybe from a specific geographic region or, or you know, a specific country where they may have volunteered to sort of capture what was their experience and what is their learning. I think alumni especially alumni that have recently returned they would have you know they're working alongside local partners they understand the local context they understand you know it could be security issues political issues so i definitely think there is an opportunity to tap into that knowledge uh, we have staff on the ground of course but the staff aren't involved in the day-to-day -day activities with local partners uh, so i think that's one area um something that we you know, we had an opportunity to think about a technical assistance program uh, in another another geographic region. And, and one thing we thought about was, you know, what is the role that alumni plays in technical assistance? So it could be, you know, somebody who wants to go back and, and, and do another stint, but at the same time, it could be engaging in alumni to help us understand, okay, what is technical assistance? So in the design of this, of this uh, particular program, we actually, uh, worked with one of our alumni as a consultant because he had been delivering technical assistance on the ground to a local government partner. And for me, that was a wealth of information because I didn't understand the challenges of, of the bureaucracy of working uh, within a government. So it's those type of examples that I'm always thinking, you know, how can we engage alumni if we're designing new programs, if we need to understand a particular challenge uh, in a country. I think it's looking for that platform or tool or resource, how can we share that information and coordinate better with our alumni? So definitely, you know, I've started to think about things that Eileen and her team are thinking about. We're always thinking about new ways to engage alumni. Um, I don't know if this is an opportunity um, for Linda to respond. Um, she's part of our communications team, but those are some initial thoughts that come to mind. 
Thank you, Tandy. I won't put Linda on the spot like that. Um, but uh, yes, she's in the background. Um, there is a question here in regards to uh, try and synthesize it a little bit. We know the pressures that are happening for that all NGOs are facing, uh, all the challenges, funding, etc. Um, so the question is, in in this context of challenges, uh, what do we need from our return volunteers and board members? And they ask to be as specific as possible. Okay, I can I can start. I can try. Uh, I think the first the first step is really uh, to stay engaged. I think it's it's uh, uh, tempting. It's easy in the current context to basically look inward and focus, you know, on your 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 own uh, situation, the situation of your family. So I would say the first, the first message is to really stay engaged, of course, at the, the family level, but the community level, uh, the regional level, the national level, but also not forgetting international issues uh, and, and, and um, changes that we want to achieve as a, as a community. Uh, also, in terms of concrete things, I would say, you know, uh, alumni can be uh, volunteers, they can become uh, donors, they can be ambassadors of the work of CUSO and share the work that we are doing. So we can recruit additional, you know, volunteers or donors uh, and also uh, demonstrate uh, in, in your own little circles and broader circles, uh, the importance of the, the work of CUSO, but also of the let's say the NGO movement and also the importance of uh, international assistance in the current context. Uh, so that might not be specific enough, but that's the, the idea that I had uh, in mind as a, as a start. Thank you, David. Well, those are all action points, so yeah. I think they are. Um, this is a simple question. Uh, will CUSO and the SHARE program be operating on a two-year assignment or will there be shorter assignments? Example, six months to one year, will that be possible? I mean, and David, you can compliment me. I mean, I think what we see in volunteering is there's definitely a stronger impact if the volunteer placement is long term. Um, however, we have employed or deployed uh, shorter term volunteers. I think under SHARE, we you know, anticipate sort of an average of a nine or ten, a 10 month placement. Um, in minimum, we try to look at six months to a year, but in a lot of cases, we have volunteers that, you know, will sign up for two years. It really depends sometimes on our local partners. We have in the past, if a local partner says to us, you know, I need a short-term volunteer and it's, you know, it's something innovative or different or necessary, we can make those concessions. But ultimately, and I think also Global First Canada, they also see the impact when we uh, send volunteers long term. I think this is an, an alternative has been the e-volunteering because we did have feedback from alumni, for example, who can no longer travel or, you know, due to commitments, not able to travel. So e-volunteering has been a way to engage volunteers short term and it's more targeted um, assistance. So, I, I mean, I think it, it, it really depends, but, but ultimately, yeah, I, I think long term placements are ideal, but, you know, we're always open um, to different, um, different opportunities. Sure. Thank you, Tandy. David, did you want to add to that before I go on or it's yeah, just around the term, the term of the yeah, placement? Just to go back to the initial question on lessons learned, I think volunteering, let's say <laughs> 20 years ago, uh, was, was different. Um, I think it was fairly easy uh, at, at that time to get a commitment for two years from a volunteer or three years. <laughs> Uh, it has been challenging to, to get that uh, in, in the last few years. And I think it's it also a reflection of the, the labor market. Uh, I think in, in a regular job, uh, in, a, in a given career, you would change a number of times, either positions or organizations. So I guess volunteering is also uh, just reflecting the, uh, the different dynamics in, in uh, employment and, and labor. Uh, so I think under voice, the average commitment uh, in terms of placement duration was about nine to 10 months uh, with longer term or so shorter term um, assignment. So I think as Tendi mentioned, it's a question of first um, being effective. In some cases, you know, a short minute can be effective, but usually it takes time, you know, to, to um, know your partner, know your colleagues, understand what the placement will be about, and then really uh, 
produce uh, something of, of value, of long-term value. And then there's also the financial considerations. Uh, there are a number of costs that QSO, uh, you know, via funding from Global First Canada, has to cover uh, preparation, uh, travel, uh, insurance. Uh, so if we have to uh, do that too many times, that it will really jeopardize the financial health of the, the program. So we're really conscious that we want to minimize the upfront cost of volunteerism. So as I mentioned, we'll be open to different models, but we want to ensure that on average, we have you know, a commitment of, of nine, around nine months for the, the placements, knowing that they could change based on the circumstances, circumstances. Thank you. And you can tell these questions are coming from a very well-informed community. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. I'm just looking at the time. I think we'll take one more. Um, uh, does CUSO make use of any form of evaluation that makes use of evaluators outside the organization? So do we partner with any universities for this purpose? Do we hire evaluators uh, from countries in which we work? This is around, uh, I guess, meal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can start and Debbie can compliment. Of course, Global Affairs Canada carries out midterm uh, and end of and end of program evaluations. Some for the midterm evaluation, uh, it's not possible for them to evaluate all 12 countries or 14 countries. So they would do a sample and visit. They would actually send a Global Affairs Canada representative who would visit the programs, talk with partners, and then from that comes quite an extensive midterm evaluation on the volunteer cooperation program. And not only speaking with QSO, they're also speaking with other organizations as well. Um, you mentioned sort of universities. We had an interesting experience uh, in Colombia where we were doing some work also with Global Affairs Canada, and we were approached by a Canadian, uh, sorry, a university out of the UK uh, that specializes in evaluating the effectiveness of programs. So they were talking to QSO in Colombia. Um, we have another project there, but Voice is, is was closely tied to some of our partnerships with this other project to see, you know, what is the impact? And I think that's also a way to have an external person look at what we're doing, what's the impact, who are you working with? So we have we have seen that um, start to happen. Thank you both. Thank you both for spending this wonderful hour with us. And just looking at the time, uh, what I would like to do now is to both give you final words to our alumni community. And I'll let you choose who wants to go first. Sure, I, I can start. I mean, I think um, it's important to thank the alumni. I myself was a CUSA volunteer back in 2004. Uh, in La Paz, Bolivia. So I, I really understand the role of the of the volunteer, what the experience is, the the impact that you can have. So I think it's important always to thank the alumni because we know people are making commitments, they're changing their lives around, they're leaving their their families in some cases. Uh, and I think alumni understand the impact of volunteering and the impact it has on the people we work with, as well as our partners. So. For me, the support of alumni is invaluable. Whether you decide to go on placement again, whether there's other ways we can engage you through uh, volunteer events, it's really important for us to continue to engage. I think we're also open to feedback on how we can better engage the alumni. That was a great question of, you know, how do we engage them? How can we sort of leverage the experience and knowledge that our alumni brings to us? I think we see a lot of alumni that can that continue to contribute to QSO through donations and other ways. So, you know, thank you and I encourage you to keep uh, supporting QSO because we do see the impact of donations or individual donations. You know, it's it's really tremendous the the impact that, you know, a monthly donation can have or an annual donation. So, so I just wanna say thank you uh, and, and definitely share your ideas with us how we continue to engage you, whether it be through events or volunteering um, or through donations, sort of what, what is the impact of QSO's work. So thank you. Thank you, Tandy. David, any final words for the community? Uh, I guess I'll be, I'll be brief. I guess my, my message will be just to ensure that we don't lose our optimism in the, in the current context. Uh, as I said before, it's easy to be a bit discouraged uh, with, with COVID and all the other problems, but you know, human beings have solved quite a number of problems and issues in the past and will continue to do so in the future. So let's look at problems as things that we will be able to fix together if we stay engaged like the, the group has been this, this morning. So thank you. 
Excellent, excellent from both of you. So thank you to our alumni. I do hope that you enjoyed a look ahead at the next seven years of CUSO's life-changing work. I invite you to stay connected through our Catalyst magazine. It's a publication that is curated with stories and anecdotes, especially for you, and it's a wonderful way to stay up to date. You can find the Catalyst magazine in a digital format on our website at www.cusointernational.org. And finally, you will be receiving a short survey. It does help us uh, curate and improve our town halls. I hope you've been enjoying them so far. You'll also be receiving uh, the recording of this alumni town hall. So once again, thank you for your service. Thank you for your support of CUSO International. Please stay safe in solidarity. Bye for now. <laughs>